of the Small Fox Ontario Backyard Chicken Information Session, which is a live recording on March 20th. Before we get too much further in, I'm going to just touch on our agenda briefly here. I'll be giving you a brief presentation on what and how the Small Flock Ontario Initiative is helping. We'll hear from our Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs Poultry Specialist, Al Dam. He's gonna to bring to light high path avian influenza exposure points in both housing and rearing on properties you should be aware of. We have our Canadian Food Inspection Agency representatives, Dr. Nancy Griffith and Victoria Wilson here with us today to give us the what's what on current high path avian influenza tips to know before you go. Our Canadian Wild Bird Health Cooperative representative, Dr. Brian Stevens is here to talk about wild bird positives and reading that dashboard. And wrapping us up before questions, we'll hear from our Featherboard Command Center operations lead, Maggie Watson, on how the command center keeps the industry informed. So starting off with Small Flock Ontario, I'm Charlotte Wall, and I work for Poultry Industry Council. We've created resources and a learning hub helping Small Flock Ontario producers. Our funding for this was created through the Sustainable Canadian Agricultural Partnership, Poultry Industry Council ourselves, the Ontario Ministry, as well as the Federal Government of Canada. You may have a couple of questions. For Small Flock Ontario, why Poultry Industry Council? What do we do and how do we do it? Well, Poultry Industry Council has for many years helped with extension of education into those who are interested in rearing or currently have backyard chickens. We run an annual webinar on a Saturday. This one is coming up this Saturday. It's information that we offer that is accurate, fact-checked, and continually helps grow our little community of backyard producers with information they can trust. Once we'd entered into that, it sort of made us the perfect venue to help share information through education, our information sharing techniques, mobilizing the knowledge and bringing together a bigger community for all of small flocks in Ontario. The better question is how are we doing that? Well, today you're seeing one example, our online training, we also have resources on a website, which we've called our resource hub. We offer information on both our social media as well as a newsletter. We have strategic projects, which help target people from um, very young to those who have been in the business for a very long time. We love attending events and locations to disseminate information directly to our backyard producers and much, much more. Our website is just that, a learning hub. Smallflockontario.ca is there with easy to navigate resources that are there anytime someone has questions day or night. We focused initially on high path avian influenza as it poses a significant risk for both industry and backyard. We've gathered our facts from experts. We've had veterinarians, CFIA themselves, OMAFRA, and just about anyone else we could look at the information we're sharing and make sure that we've got all of the facts people need. Sometimes having the facts isn't enough though. You have to make it visually appealing. So these topics are a resource that are offered in many visual effects to be quick, easy references to basically troubleshoot where you're at. We then took our information from people who had worked in the field, those who had questions, and made a frequently asked questions section. This is a great starting point if people are suffering with a high mortality, if they think they might be in at a risk, or if they have any other questions about backyard flocks. The trick with giving frequently asked question information though is plain language. We can carry it on that plain language motif with both our booklets and our website. On our website, you can find information that we have printed limited quantities, but you can download, print, access, or save that information at any time. If those of you out there are more like the teenagers in my house, they'd rather watch a video than read a book. So we have some of those too. These range from a two minute snippet on biosecurity demonstration of how to get into your coop safely all the way up to uh, two hour webinars featuring hosts of specialized speakers 
on everything from migration to current outbreaks and cleaning. Our whole goal is to build a community, but not just any community, not just any Facebook group, but we're looking for people to trust experts and use the information that they have. In order to keep these people informed, we do encourage them to subscribe to our newsletter. It's not very often that we send it out, but if there is a warning from our Featherboard Command Center or there are locations of illness, we share that along with information like this, our free webinars or educational events that we might be speaking at that could be in your town. In the event of an actual infected premise, we have a caseworker team. These are a small group of people spread across the province. They are there and specifically trained to keep themselves and others safe with very detailed biosecurity donning and doffing of their equipment, as well as working together with CFIA to make sure that they understand what is needed and they can advocate on behalf of the owners successfully to make sure that everyone understands the process, questions get answered, and people are able to move from that infected zone to a roped premise as quickly and easily as possible. Now, is it effective? How well are we doing? What are other ways that we could improve? This is where we want to hear from you. This QR code on your screen will allow you to send us feedback so we can curate specific resources that are relevant to you, your community, and how we can help. I do want to just briefly say thank you all for joining us today. And without further ado, I'm going to move along to our very next speaker, who is our Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. Poultry Specialist, Al Dam. Thanks again for joining us today, Al. I'll let you take it over. Hello. Okay, great. Uh, I am going to just put this up. Thanks. Okay, so welcome everyone for taking uh, part of your afternoon to sit down with us. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, where and what is the disease risk when it comes to small flock or urban poultry. This is who I am. I'm your Provincial Poultry Specialist with OMAFRA. Uh, over at the Vet College here in Guelph. Uh, if you need to get hold of me, there's some of my contact information, and I'm sure Charlotte can share that uh, if you need after the fact. Um, so why do people raise chickens or ducks or geese or want, want some sort of feathers on their property, uh, food? And I'm going to put in maybe companionship because a lot of these uh, animals do turn into pets uh, at that point. Um, they want to know what's in their own food supply. They want to know what was fed to them, to their animals. Um, better life for the bird, I put that in a, with a question mark because uh, sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. And that can be a challenge for you if you end up in a situation where you've got um, some animal husbandry problems and potential animal welfare issues. Uh, there is an educational aspect for, for kids on this. There is some mental health aspects of, of owning poultry. Um, when people say it's a revenue generator in town, I would say you do not want to get into that. And if people want to get birds in town because they're going to have a cheap source of food, you can X that one off also. This will be probably some of the most expensive eggs they will consume. Now, I always get asked, what can I raise without quota? Because poultry is supply managed. So chickens, turkeys, eggs, and breeders. So in a rural area, you can have 99 hens per person. Uh, per premise, you can have 300 broilers under the family food program or 3,000 birds with the artisanal program with Chicken Farmers of Ontario. You can have 50 turkeys um, and it's farm gate sales only unless it's artisanal. So farm gate sales mean you can stick a sign at the end of the road saying eggs for sale, chicken for sale, turkeys for sale, but you can't sell it at the local farmer's market at church or at the store unless it's artisanal and inspected. Um, other species are unregulated, so waterfowl and game birds, which means you can grow as many as you want in a rural area. Now, in town, if you wanna do this in town, that's your business and your problem. So it's up to you to uh, put whatever limits you want on that. And most of the challenges we see is people are putting in, allowing too many birds in town. Now, uh, one thing is constant though, uh, the flaws of good management when it comes to raising birds. So FLAW stands for feed, light, air, water, space, and sanitation. And with any of these things, if you provide them adequately for a bird and it's in decent health, 
it should thrive. But the things like water, space, and sanitation uh, and feed is where we can have some potential di disease uh, scenarios. So how do I mitigate potential disease risks? Well, first question is what are the types of diseases of concern? And of course, AI is the first one, but there's others too, right? So um, there's the animal health component. There's also a human health component because um, things like E. coli and salmonella can be an issue. And it could be both because we also have zoonotic diseases. And a zoonotic disease is a disease that can be passed from humans to animals or from animals to humans. So uh, what are some of the diseases of concern? All well, the salmonellas, of course. E. coli, uh, infectious meringual tracheitis is something we see in small flocks a fair bit. That's a bird health issue. It's not a human health issue. Even influenza. Um, so the salmonellas and E. coli, the birds can have that and still be okay with the influenzas. That's potentially zoonotic also, but it, that can affect uh, both humans and avian species. Uh, plus there's many more and I'm not a vet. We actually have some vets coming on Line, if you have any other questions, uh, we can take those at the end of the at the end of the presentation or at the end of the session. Now, how do birds get sick? Um, it's often through direct contact with other sick birds, so domestic or wild secretions and or feces of infected birds, other sick animals. So that can include uh, other like mam mammals, whether that's rodents or the neighborhood cat or dog or skunks or whatever. Uh, contaminated surfaces are another place where that can happen uh, and contaminated food and water supplies. So these are things you'll have to think about when you're entertaining any sort of poultry bylaw. What are the disease risks? Well, of course, feed storage, housing, including outdoor runs, uh, equipment, and cleaning and disinfection. So, you know, here's a picture of some feed that's put in a garbage can. You think that's great. I actually do not recommend storing feed in a plastic garbage can, right? Because a metal garbage can makes sense. It's rodent proof. Plastic, rodents will chew through. Um, this is a picture of some of a chicken dust bath. Birds need to dust bathe to help deal with uh, ex in external mites. Uh, that's they, they like to do that. So providing that's going to be important. Foot baths or some sort of... Um, disease prevention from coming into the flock is going to be important. Other disease risks include equipment, waters, feeders, of course, brooding versus ready to lay. So this is an important thing. Uh, if you're thinking about backyard hens, uh, we recommend, or I recommend getting a ready to lay hen at 19 weeks from Pullets Plus or Bonnie's or Fry's or from whomever, because that hen is going to be 20 weeks old, ready to lay. She'll have been vaccinated to build you the strongest hen possible. You buy a day old chick, we're dealing with brooding uh, and all those issues. And then they don't get an egg out of that chick until 20 weeks later. Some of those chicks might be roosters. You got to deal with that too. Now, of course, pest and, pest and predators are going to be an issue. And I call this the urban vermin Challenge. Um, so we're dealing with mice, skunks, coons, uh, even possums. Now, possums are a little different. Like they, I like possums. I hate raccoons <laughs> because of many numerous issues. Um, but all of these can impact. And of course, I always talk about this. And th this is pretty much a ubiquitous issue with any poultry. Um, if you're building a coop and people say, oh, it's rodent proof. A dime and a quarter. What's the significance of a dime and a quarter? Uh, if it's the size of a quarter, a rat can fit through. If it's the size of a dime, a mouse can fit through. So making something rodent proof is really hard, especially when it comes to urban poultry flocks. Snap traps are an option. Uh, bait is not as recommended because then those, those animals are dying somewhere. Uh, but once again, you have poultry, with feed that's accessible, uh, you're going to collect some of these challenges. I often get asked about, you know, what kills birds. Well, lots of things kills birds. They're a, they're a prey animal. So, you know, dogs can take them out. Weasels and mink, if you have them in town. Uh, coons, possums, other raptors like owls or uh, eagles or hawks. 
uh, foxes and coyotes, skunks, and of course, you know, several birds gone with no clues. That could be your neighbor. And you get to deal with that. Ha housing can be portable shelters. And we see this all the time. They could look like this. They may not. Uh, you, you chuckle. I, I, when I first saw this, I chuckled a little bit, but I went, well, actually, this is a really fantastic thing because it's movable, but the birds are kept inside and they're under shelter. Um, I don't recommend you building these in the backyard, but you can get units that look like this um, that can be bought and paid for. Now, not necessarily in town, but this works for some of our uh, rural uh, folks, but um, portable shelters are a thing, but that may not be something you want to deal with in town, especially if you're going to be overwintering birds. Th this is not an overwintering option. Uh, the one nice thing about some of these shelters, though, is that the birds are kept contained. Now, permanent shelters, you know, harsh climates can be insulated. Uh, you can have nest boxes and forage locations. You can attach a, an outdoor coop to it. But uh, if you're going to have an urban poultry bylaw, you're going to need to look at some permanent shelters unless you're like, you're not going to want to deal with birds being housed o overwintered in, a, in an aluminum drive shed. And I've been asked, do I really need to winterize the coop because chickens are hardy, right? Well, no, you're going to need a heat source uh, because birds are not meant and eggs are not meant to be in the cold at minus 20. Uh, and we do get that, not this year, but we do get cold weather. So that's it for me, uh, Charlotte. If there's any questions, I guess we'll leave those off to the end, right? You know it, Al. Thank you very much. We'll handle all the Q&As at the end of all presentations. We're going right. to promptly now move along to our next presenter. Um, and it's a pair. So we have Dr. Nancy Griffith as well as Victoria Wilson joining us from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. They're gonna tell us a bit about their resources and things that you should know. Thank you again, ladies, for joining us. Thanks uh, very much. And uh, Tori's gonna maneuver the PowerPoint for me since we're sharing this. <clears throat> so we're just gonna have a little bit of a high path AI update for what's been going on in the country since the spring. Um, so Tori, if you want to go to the next slide. So um, as everyone's probably aware, we've been having AI cases since about the end of 2021. This is just what's happening in Canada um, since uh, about May 6, 2023. And there's been about a total of 100 cases. And by that, I mean a premises that has AI and <clears throat> the vast majority of them in that time, well, over 50% has been in BC. So they've taken the brunt of most of this. And uh, as you can see from the slide as well, 75% um, of those are in commercial poultry and the other 25% in non-commercial, um, which also includes what we call non-poultry or backyard flocks. And I'll just, um, give the definition of those shortly. In, sorry, in Ontario, we've only had uh, two cases since the spring. And whoops, <laughs> thanks. Um, we've only had two cases. Uh, one was in the fall of this year, and we had a case here in Ontario also in January. And out of our primary control zones in Canada, the 100 we've revoked almost everything. So right now, um, as we go into the spring migration, we only have eight active PCZs. Next slide. So the definition of commercial poultry in Canada, they're raised under supply management, which is the quota system. And they usually have, uh, usually fairly obvious and have a considerable number of birds, uh, usually a thousand or more. Um, but we can also have birds that are raised outside the quota system with a thousand or more birds. And when we're talking about poultry, we're generally talking chickens or turkeys. We do call uh, commercial poultry only 300 and seriforms, and that's ducks and geese primarily. And these are involved, um, all of these premises in producing, buying, selling, uh, poultry and their and their products. Next slide. 
the non-commercial birds are um, those that aren't commercial um, and they may be in smaller flocks, um, but they do sell their products locally for limited sales for breeding, but they do not have uh, any contact with, with the larger commercial premises. <clears throat> And for everyone here, when we're talking about most backyard flocks, we're talking about non-poultry. Uh, that's the category that we use. So they are um, usually a small number of birds. And um, importantly, in terms of AI and defining whether they're non-poultry or not, in the critical period before they had clinical signs, which is usually 14 days, they have not had any birds leave the premise, they have not sold anything, and um, they have not had any contact with uh, any commercial premises. And basically those are people that are just using eggs, um, you know, for their own purposes or maybe giving to family members. And those are called for CFIA purposes, non-poultry. And that does make a difference when it comes to primary control zones. Uh, in Canada. Next slide. <clears throat> so what is a primary control zone? And that is basically a 10 kilometer zone around an infected premise that's been uh, confirmed positive for avian influenza. And it's made up of a three kilometer infected zone and um, a restricted zone that's uh, the three to 10 kilometers. Um, <clears throat> and while we call it a circle, uh, and that's kind of how we start putting that zone around an infected premise, it, it does, um, uh, you know, go by road. So it usually ends up being uh, not a circle. It's uh, um, some sort of rectangle or, you um, odd shaped thing um, and some pieces might be 13 kilometers um, based on roads um, but it is a minimum of 10 kilometers and uh, what happens is um, we do have a primary control zone being released from infected zone and restricted zone to become a security zone and I'll just talk about what happens um, <clears throat> with these zones and and what the milestones are to make those changes. Next slide. So the factors that increase risk for AI specifically. So it is the migration season. So we do have um, a spring migration and a fall migration. And those are typically when we see peak cases of AI but we have seen over the past couple of years that they have straggled um, uh, in between those particular seasons. As I said, we had one in January and we don't know whether that's late fall or early spring. Um, and given the changes that we're having in, in climate, um, it's uh, uh, not as clear cut as it used to be. Um, certainly being uh, close to wet areas, so any ponds or swamps or uh, rivers where you have wild birds is going to be a definite risk factor. Uh, lack of biosecurity, a lot of movement of birds within a premises, and any wild birds that actually access the barns and come uh, directly uh, onto the property is certainly going to increase uh, risk for AI. Well, birds having access to carcasses and having, um, again, backyard flocks that are outside. And we do see um, backyard flocks that have ducks in them that are directly interacting with uh, wild ducks. So that's um, a huge risk for getting AI. Um, and mixed flocks of, of any type. So again, we have um, backyard flocks with uh, ducks or geese that are outside and they're in contact with wild birds. Um, and they are also in contact potentially with, with uh, chickens and other, <clears throat> and other birds that people have that um, are kept on the property. Next slide. So, 
just to talk a little bit about what happens when a positive result comes in, and it doesn't matter whether you're a commercial farm or whether you're a backyard flock, you are going to have the same series of events going on. So when we have a, a suspicion, a high suspicion of high path AI, we place a declaration of infected premises and a requirement to quarantine on that property. And that stays on once we get the positive results. Those are the primary documents that are used to control movements on and off the premises. And then we create these primary control zones. The difference with the non-poultry, and we're always happy in CFIA when we don't have to make a primary control zone, um, and the non-poultry or the backyard flocks, um, <clears throat> they are the situation where we do not create that 10 kilometer zone, but we do for everything else. We um, <clears throat> put another document on those uh, positive premises. So all the barns, but it is all the susceptible species on the positive premise has um, a document placed on it that is called a requirement to dispose. And that really means that all of these susceptible species on that premises are destroyed and that disposal occurs. And there's three types uh, primarily of disposal. <clears throat> Composting is what most commercial barns do. So they build um, piles in their barns and those uh, include the carcasses of the uh, destroyed birds, uh, sometimes includes any feed that was in the barn, litter, manure, it can include eggs, and they build these large piles. And then once those are built, they are what we term capped. Um, and that means that they're just covered in usually something that's um, a mulch, for example. And uh, once those piles are capped, then the risk is reduced of any virus um, being spread from those carcasses. And then we stick in that large temperature probes and we watch the temperature of that pile. <clears throat> and so bioheat treatment is the way that we confirm destruction of the virus within that compost pile. And that means they've had 37 degrees Celsius or above for six consecutive days. And once we have that, then we can confirm that the um, that the virus has been uh, destroyed and the piles can go outside after that. Uh, the other ways we dispose of birds are through burial and incineration, but those are usually for um, Non-commercial flocks, backyard flocks will go to those types of um, disposal methods as we have uh, many fewer carcasses to deal with. Next slide. Just uh, as I mentioned, we don't have any primary control zone around backyard flocks or non-poultry, but we do around commercial and non-commercial. And this is basically what is happening, just to give people an idea of how these zones actually progress through and are then revoked. So we start with an infected premise and we've got a positive, we establish our primary control zone, and then we start immediate surveillance. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, there's different types of surveillance, but uh, a lot of it is based on uh, surveillance of mortality. And that begins as soon as we can get producers contacted and get people on surveillance. And this is uh, commercial producers that are on this typically. And they start that surveillance and it continues on until the release of the primary control zone. And there's uh, a few milestones in there. Um, disposal, uh, when that's complete at the infected premise, and disposal, again, for us means capping of that pile, or it could mean that the carcasses have been buried or incinerated, or whatever has been deemed to be the disposal method at that particular premise is complete. 
We continue surveillance for a minimum of 14 days, and then we do infected zone release testing. So uh, the infected zone commercial producers have, um, <clears throat> again, another uh, uh, series of mortality tests done. And when their uh, results are back and they're negative, the security zone replaces the infected zone and the restricted zone. And um, we then wait until we have uh, more things happening at the infected premises, the next milestone being primary decontamination. And whether that's a commercial premise or a backyard law, that's basically talking about things like, um, well, it's, it's pretty much a dry clean. So all of the, uh, you know, any feathers, any manure, um, feed, dirt, uh, everything has been cleaned out of the barns. And that's every single part of that barn, the ceilings, the floors, all equipment, feeders, um, uh, nests. Um, it could uh, also include um, outdoor enclosures and any equipment uh, that's been around that's deemed to be infected. And once that dry clean has been done and approved by CFIA, then we have a 28 day post outbreak surveillance period. And again, commercial producers in the zone participate in this mortality testing. When we have uh, all the results back and they're negative, we release the primary control zone. And generally uh, this process can take up to three months. That's kind of an average time for a primary control zone to be up and then released, but it is based on what happens at the infected premises. So the quicker they get things done, the quicker we move through these uh, milestones and into post outbreak surveillance. Next slide. And that's you, Tori. All right, happy to step in here. Um, so have you ever wondered if you fall within a zone or if you're traveling through a zone? I thought I would share a little tutorial on the interactive map we have available on our website. Um, so I've included the link below in this presentation just to like directly to the map. But if you're looking to find it after this presentation, can't remember, didn't save the link, um, you can just go into your internet browser and pull up our inspection website. Um, it's just, you can Google CFA and it comes up as the first one. So I will share that here. Um, so this is our inspection website here. Um, you just scroll down, you can see animal health. Scroll down again, and we have under features, we have avian influenza detections. And again, there is a lot of scrolling down. This website has a ton of um, links, information, anything kind of you want to know about AI, it's all right here on this website. Um, so then you scroll down into additional information, highly pathogenic avian influenza zones, and then map. So here you can see this is our virtual map here. Um, so we do have a little box at the top of our map. Um, this is just where so you can search any address to see if, if it falls within a zone. Um, and I found a couple of random locations that would fall within zones just to kind of show you how the tool does work. Um, so to start us off, I'll search a location that's not currently within any zones. So bear with me as I try and type in front of everybody. So here you can see there's a little red X that shows up. There's no, there's no color or zone around it, but if you do zoom out um, on this map, you can see these little gray patches that show up. So these are zones that have been revoked and they're no longer active. Um, so the next example I have of, is of an address that is within both a commercial infected zone and a commercial restricted zone. So again, I'll just search the address in here. Um, this one was a little more tricky for me to pinpoint an address um, all the way out there, but I did find a lake that's within the zone. Um, so you can see a red rectangle just because I gave a general area um, instead of an address. Um, so the little red X isn't there. Um, but if I zoom out a little bit, you can see 
that it does have um, the pink area being the infected zone um, in the middle here, and then the purple area around um, is, is the restricted zone. Um, and then um, third example shows um, an address that's in a non-commercial infected zone. So again, they're, they're all kind of different colors. So um, again, we have that little red X or T, however you're kind of looking at it there. Um, and it's inside that green area, which is the non-commercial non infected zone. Um, and then around here, you can see that the yellow here is the non-commercial restricted zone. So that's the, the three to 10 ish and kind of what Nancy was mentioning earlier is we do try and aim for a little bit of a circle but it it usually ends up being a little bit lopsided in some sense um and then lastly I have an example of what a commercial security zone would look like um and then this is more local to us it's here in Ontario um so this paper There we go. So the little red X um, shows the address that I typed in. It's within this big red area. Um, and then according to the legend on the side here, um, you can see that it is a commercial security zone. Um, and it is the entire zone right now. So it's the entire approximate 10 kilometer area. So it is just the one color. Um, so that's exactly how you would find any any address anywhere you're traveling to through around. If you want to see where it falls, you can just come to this this link here and, and search the address. Um, I also wanted to point out that if there are any questions related to moving poultry or poultry products through into or out of a zone, there's a handy link above the map um, right here um, that says permits um, permits are required. Um, so you can just click that and it'll give you basic information on permitting. So you can kind of choose here, um, is your movement into, out of, or within, or through a non-commercial zone? And then you select whatever, whatever it falls under, and then there will be can, um, general information of what you will need to find or use. So be sure to head over and check out the interactive map, as well as the other resources we do have available here. Um, um, so I've given lots of um, resources here just to get you started, lots of cool information on cleaning and disinfection, resuming operations, and even the path to revoking a primary control zone. Um, so if you can think of any questions after this webinar today, the website's definitely a great place to start looking and, and hopefully find your answer. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tori and Nancy. Um, I love the highlighting that mixed blocks are definitely, you know, a higher risk and those that get into duck ponds may be a higher risk again. So that all being said, we're gonna now go from commercial and non-commercial and non-poultry and take a walk on the wild side with Dr. Brian Stevens from the Canadian Wild Birth Health Cooperative. He too is going to help you how to know how to check those maps, know what your risks are. Thank you again today for joining us, Brian. I'll let you take over. Perfect. Thanks, Charlotte. So I'm going to talk about wild birds today. And the first thing I'll mention is that what I'm going to be discussing here is birds that have specifically died from avian influenza infection. Um, and you should know that wild birds in general specifically ducks are the ones who are likely carrying this virus. Um, so there are many wild birds out there that are going to have the virus, but not necessarily get sick or die from it. Um, so you should be aware that the risk zone for avian influenza is pretty much everywhere at this point. We know that it is across the continent um, and pretty much across the world at this point. Uh, so there is no real safe spot from this, but I will at least give you an idea as to where we're seeing birds that are getting severely affected in the wild associated with it. Um, so if you've been to any of these in the past, I typically will try and bring up what we've seen previously and where we are now. So this was where I kind of left things the last time I talked to a group like this, um, kind of the end of November of 2023. Um, and I basically have this little slide to show you 
what we've been seeing with this virus since it hit North America and specifically Ontario. Um, so if you look at the numbers here between 2022 spring and 2023, um, we had very similar number of positive wild birds um, that were dying as a result of this disease. The main difference we saw between 22 and 23 was geographically where these birds were dying. So when it first showed up, it was pretty much everywhere. All birds were similarly naive to the virus. They were becoming severely infected and many were dying. Whereas in 23, it really was focused on the GTA. And we think that that may have been resident birds that may have avoided uh, exposure to this virus in 2022. And then when they were exposed during spring migration in 2023, that's possibly when they all became affected and uh, severely ill and many of them died during that time. Uh, when it came to the fall, we saw a few different things. In 2022, the numbers were very similar to what we saw in the spring migratory period, um, and that was helped along by a mortality event in snow geese in eastern Ontario. Um, but then 23, up until the kind of mid to end of November, we really weren't seeing high pass deaths in our wild bird populations, which was good for our wild birds in that it seemed like many of them maybe were becoming exposed to it and had developed some sort of immunity up to this point. Um, so up until November 20th, we really hadn't had an H5 positive bird um, that had died that had at least come through our service. Um, that did change over the, the coming months. Um, so kind of leading up to the end of the fall of 2023 and heading into the winter, um, we did start to get some of our Arctic species moving through the province. So we did have some tundra swans moving through the St. Clair National Wildlife Area, um, probably about a half a dozen or so that were brought to us. Um, and there was a few small mortality events with those uh, birds. And then similar to what we saw in 2022, out in eastern Ontario and into Quebec, there was some mortality event with the large number of snow geese that moved through that area. So Embron uh, was one area that we really saw in 2022, quite a few snow geese being affected. This year we did have um, a handful that were uh, found to be sick and some had died, um, but not to the same degree. So just to give you an example, we only got three snow geese from that area this year versus 15 the previous year. Um, and hearing about reports out there, this year we only had a handful, maybe up to a dozen snow geese that were um, sick and dying, whereas the year previous it had been over 60 that were dying. So things were still looking pretty good. Not as many wild birds seemed to be dying from this virus. Um, and then we got into February um, where pretty much things just changed and we weren't expecting them to change at this point. Uh, so soon after um, I gave the talk last time, we did start to get a few Canada geese showing up, mainly in the Cambridge area. Um, and it was just a scattering of Canada geese that were being found dead. Uh, it then followed into places like Vaughan and Belleville and Brampton. Um, again, a scattering of geese in Belleville, I think it was a dozen or more, so a little bit of a higher mortality event. But the other ones were really just a handful of geese or just one or two geese kind of found in different areas of the city. Um, and then Kingston. Kingston hit, and you may have seen this come via different news sources, um, but beginning of February, there was a huge mortality event of Canada geese in the Lake Ontario Park region of Kingston, um, with over 100 Canada geese that had been found dead or were euthanized with signs consistent with avian influenza. We got in, I think, anywhere from 8 to 12 Canada geese from that region, all of them were testing positive for the H5N1 um, uh, virus. So it seemed like highly pathogenic avian influenza was the cause of death in those geese. And then as we've seen, we started to get in the scavengers a few weeks later. So we did get bald eagle from the region that um, preliminary tested positive, red-tailed hawks, and a number of crows from Kingston. And then we also saw in Napanee a little bit further west from Kingston, but then a bit further east in Ottawa and Cornwall, a number of crows dying at that point. Um, so this was a little unexpected because this was not associated with the migratory uh, events that we typically see this virus associated with. Um, so nobody, as far as we are aware, was moving back up north during end of January, early February. Everyone was still where they were expected to be. 
So the question came, why did this happen at this time? Um, one theory that was put out there was that we had had a cold snap a few weeks earlier, um, which may have led to geese clustering together to stay warm. That would allow for the virus to spread a bit easier. And because they were uh, dealing with such a cold snap, it may have also caused stress on their systems. It may have made them slightly more immunocompromised, which may have allowed the virus to um, run more rampant within them and allow for a more severe infection in these geese. Again, that's just a theory. I don't know if that's what's actually happened, uh, but presumably these were all resident Canada geese that then got into a big group and the virus just spread throughout them and they, unfortunately, a lot of them ended up dying. So what can we expect for our spring migration period, which we should be starting right now? Um, realistically, it's unclear what to expect. Um, I don't know if we're gonna see similar numbers to what we've seen over the past couple of years where we're gonna see large mortality events in our Canada geese and other species, or whether or not it's gonna be more similar to the early fall of last year where we really had a lack of severe cases um, at this point, especially with the Kingston birds, I don't know if we can actually guess what we're going to be getting going forward, uh, but it's something that we at CWHC are trying to keep our eyes on for the for the most part. Um, so one of the questions that I know people have is where you can find information about what's going on with wild birds and where can you find information about it. Um, the best resource that we have is this wild bird dashboard run by the CFIA. They get data from samples that ourselves and Environment and Climate Change Canada send them um, to um, populate this map. Um, and I'm not going to run through exactly how to uh, use this, but one of the things that you can do is you can zoom in on different areas to look specifically at Ontario. You can also click on these little uh, graphs on the side here um, to specifically just select Ontario. And then the other thing is when you get these recently um, entered cases, you can actually click on each individual one and it'll put a little dot for specifically where it was found in the province. So if you're looking for the most recent cases, um, that's probably the best way to do it is kind of click through these little, uh, um, each individual bird here, and then you can see where across the province it was found. Unfortunately, this map is not gonna be as up to date as we would like it to be. Um, we are typically about three to four weeks behind. So I took a screenshot of this last week and you can see the earliest or the most recent are from February 13th. So they're about four weeks behind and I just checked today and I think the most recent ones are about February 27th or so. Um, so we are a couple weeks behind with that. Um, so there really isn't a great place to keep up to date on what's happening right now in the field. Um, but that is going to give you a good sense as to what's been going on over the past few weeks, at least. Um, the best way that we can really keep up to date with what's going on is to have all of you. You really are the, the eyes in the field for us when it comes to this disease. If you do notice that there are sick or dead wild birds out there, then please contact us at CWHC. Um, I have listed here, we do have a toll-free number. We have an email address you can uh, send us an email or we have an online reporting tool as well that you can utilize. And again, I do want to reiterate that what I'm talking about right now is just wild birds that are getting sick and dying from this, and that that doesn't necessarily represent where the virus is across the province. Um, and I think Kingston's the best uh, example of that, is that we know the virus is just out there all the time, um, and we really have to be vigilant regardless of what time of year it is, but the migratory periods are really when a lot of animals are moving through. And that really is when the biggest risk comes into play is during that spring and fall migratory period. Um, and that's all I, I have to talk about today. Um, but if you have questions about wild birds, then I will stick around for the Q&A afterwards. Thank you very much, Dr. Stevens. Um, great point that the tracking is really just animals that are dead and uh, eventually they get posted that they were confirmed or not. Um, but yeah, it's, it at least it's a great resource to have a look and see how hot of a spot you might be in or traveling into for those who travel. 
Yeah. So much information in, in the world of poultry on how and when and where illness is happening. You might be asking yourself, how does industry even keep track and who communicates all of this to us in a timely method, manner? The answer is our Feather Forward Command Center. And joining us today is Maggie Watson, who's going to tell you a little bit about how they keep the industry informed and hopefully helps us all spur on some ideas on how we can all keep each other informed. Thanks again for joining us, Maggie. Thank you. All right. So... Yes, so uh, my name's Maggie, I'm from the Featherboard Command Center. Um, so I'll just go over really quickly how we keep um, the poultry industry informed and how that includes um, small flock owners as well. Okay, um, so the Featherboard Command Center is a uh, coordinated effort between uh, the four supply managed um, marketing boards. Um, so that's the Chicken Farmers of Ontario, um, Egg Farmers of Ontario, pa Ontario Broiling, Hatching Egg and Chick Commission, um, and then the Ontario Turkey Farmers. And, and we also have the um, Ontario Poultry Service uh, sector members on our board as well. Um, and they actually often cooperate with small flock owners a little bit closer sometimes. Um, so that's their good, important members as well to have. Um, so how the FBCC operates is using all the aspects of the emergency management continuum, um, with the focus here really being on this bottom part, which is our mission. Um, so through collaboration with farmers, um, industry partners, and the government, FBCC helps to prevent the potential spread of highly infectious diseases and protect the industry to ensure continuous supply of high quality poultry and poultry products to consumers. Um, so. There we go. Okay. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is the collaboration with farmers and small flock parts, um, and that's the notifications. So these are some of the targeted infectious diseases that I mentioned. So we don't have to go through all of them. Um, the important part to note um, is that they can be federally reportable diseases or provincially notifiable hazards. So they're particularly laid out and um, noted diseases already. Um, in different legislation. And they're either um, federally reportable to the CFIA um, or the Ministry of Agricultural, Agricultural Food and Rural Affairs. I should really be able to spit that off by now. Um, and uh, they will be the lead agencies. And then the FBCC and the four uh, poultry marketing boards um, work through um, FBCC to lead the industry's response. Um, but we follow the a government agency that is leading, depending on what type of um, disease it is. So we do that using the FBCC emergency management plan or disease specific plans. <coughs> Excuse me, and these are on our website. So if you're interested in looking into what the plans entail, um, you can look through those on our website as well. So how we do this? Um, uh, keeping the industry notified is through mainly disease alerts and advisories. Um, and anyone in the poultry industry, small flock owners, um, municipalities can sign up um, for disease alerts on the website. So this is what they look like. This is a um, HPAI biosecurity advisory. So this is actually the same one that um, Tori was showing you for Amherstburg. And that was the red zone she was showing you. Um, so the important parts of it um, are the biosecurity advisory area. So how that's different um, from the area Tori was showing you is the industry will send out a biosecurity advisory area before CSIA um, puts out their primary control zone, or most, most often it's before. Um, and that area is um, an indication um, to the poultry industry um, and anyone who receives it that this is the approximate 10 kilometer area where we'd like to practice heightened biosecurity um, and try to avoid uh, to limit the spread of the disease. Uh, we will send those out for all poultry premises. Do so you remember Nancy and Tori uh, from CFA talking about non-poultry premises? We will not um, push these out to commercial farmers or registered uh, small flock growers 
or non-poultry premises. Um, they will be posted on our website uh, by municipality name, um, but for non-poultry premises, but they will not have a map associated with them um, or an advisory. Um, and just to review there, so they are pushed out, the advisory is pushed out to all quota holdings of commercial farms um, and all registered small flocks, as well as anyone who registers themselves for an FBCC disease alert on the website. Uh, we also send disease alerts out for other types of um, infectious disease, so ILP, which is infectious thrombotracheitis. You heard Al mention that one at the beginning. Um, these are this is a disease where there won't be um, a government agency necessarily um, sending out an advisory like the FIA. Um, so we will send these ones out to anyone who's registered um, or signed themselves up. We'll also send out a stand down. Um, and then Small Flock Ontario or PIC will also rebroadcast these uh, as well. Uh, advisories also will always contain links to the important pieces and advisories that are linked within them. Um, so they'll indicate what level of biosecurity uh, farmers and small flock owners should be practicing and then link them directly to those. On the FBCC website, we maintain a log of all the incidents that are ongoing. Um, so on the left-hand side, they have incidents listed by municipality name. Um, and then on the bottom, if you scroll down when you're on the homepage, there is an incident status by municipality. Uh, so let's say you heard there's an incident going on and you logged in and you didn't see it anymore, you could see that it was just closed recently um, since you had last been on the website. And then another, let's say maybe fun fact, is that we use um, the lower or single tier municipality name. Um, so not super popular in all places, but that is um, how we do it to keep uh, consistent with, with CFI and MFR as well. Uh, and then just the last uh, type of biosecurity advisory that we send out um, is a general province-wide heightened biosecurity advisory. So we do these uh, seasonally on a risk basis. Um, and these are not related to maybe one particular incident, but just generally to kind of indicate that a general level of heightened biosecurity should be practiced across the province. Um, and these are good because we can point um, individuals to specific resources that are targeted to them. So for example, small flock growers can go to PIC, small, small flock Ontario, um, to get support there. Okay. There's a, a map of the, uh, the wave that went on, but Tori showed you that one, so you can go there. Uh, yes, okay. So there you go. Similarly, if you have any questions, um, you can always email us to the website and you can sign up for the disease alert on fbcc.com uh, or .ca. Thank you very much for joining us, Maggie. Um, and here we are, less than 60 seconds left until the end of our webinar, which I think is phenomenal timing. We did have one question pop into the Q&A and it was regarding the sharing of information. We will send out a link to this recording as soon as possible to everyone who registered. So whether you got called away to a last minute meeting or you were able to join us for the entire event, you will have access to the material. Um, just before we head out onto the rest of the, our day, I wanted to mention um, very briefly here, under our resources, um, which as we were joking was a lot of scrolling down. First under home, um, as a, uh, Tori mentioned, you sometimes have to scroll down, but transmission of bird flu to people. We do have a dedicated document there that you can check out at any time to make sure that you know before you get onto a site what that's like. And we also briefly discussed um, migration. So if you were at the top of our website and looking for other resources just to know what is the status in your area, you would have to roll down past some of our booklets, but I've shared in the chat the CFIA zone map 
as well as Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative uh, reporting tool. You can also see their wildlife map. At the very bottom, we have a migration map. And due to the climate change this year or recently, it's been a little different than it has in the past. But this is a live migration map. It is only the United States, but we kind of understand that they don't just stop at the border, they will continue on. So you can always see the status of migration and it will allow you to go back by year, by date, by month um, and get a just a perspective. If that's what it's like today, what was it like a year ago? And you can see live data on how the migration is happening and the number of birds that may be in the area or potentially affecting flocks and wildlife near you. As I mentioned earlier, we thank you all for joining. We are working to curate a community of communication and we need to know what you need from us. So feel free to reach out. We will have a survey pop up in the browser at the end of this event. Um, and we would like to know what makes a difference to you within your role, what can we do to help facilitate and what do you need to hear more of um, also, if you have either been called to a, a small flock, a poultry, a bylaw, you know, chickens in a ditch problem by a neighbor complaint, there are a few things you can do to make sure that you're safe going in and you have the best informed information. Al touched on what are the risks when you're looking at the housing that may mean this flock is at a higher risk. Um, we've also listened to CFIA saying check the map and know if you're entering a potential zone. And then Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative telling us how to know what the dead percentage of high path AI in your area is, indicating wildlife um, issues. And then we went right on to uh, our friends at Featherboard Command Center with ways that you can stay informed ahead of the curve. If you have other questions, comments, or suggestions, again, the survey will be there and we'll share it again with the link for the recording. Thank you all for joining us and we hope that you have a wonderful Wednesday.